Thank you, Joseph. <laughs> Let us pray. I've got used, so used to announcing people in the last, introducing people in the last couple of weeks that it was, I thought I would have to introduce myself, then run over there, and then come on <laughs> without falling over anything. But anyway, thank, good afternoon, everybody. And welcome, I'll oh, forget that speech. Welcome to the International Watercolour Masters Exhibition and welcome to my demonstration. Before I start, as I will be the last demo during this IWM, um, one or two people to thank. I'd like to thank our TV producer, Gary Templeman. <laughs> who's done a reasonable job in the last couple of weeks. <laughs> I'd also like to thank my soulmate, Tara, for being with me through thick and thin. <laughs> because it has been challenging the last four years. It's been rough. But here we are at last, and we've, we've actually got it together. Um, I'd like to thank my IWM team, James, who's gone home, uh, Michelle, who's doing manning the sales desk, and please buy a painting. Please buy one, because you never know, if enough people buy paintings, we might be able to do it again, if we survive this one. If you can't buy a painting, then buy my book. <laughs> right, now, on with, the, on with the show. Right, so, um, those... Was that, a, was that a heckler? What did you say? Oh, um, so... <laughs> Um, those familiar with my uh, work know, will know, uh, that I paint, um, my subjects are the abandoned, the overlooked, the work things and places of mankind that most people would just, just walk by because they don't feel they're significant enough. But to me, I treat my subjects as I would a portrait of an elderly person with great sympathy. To me, my, the things I paint are not inanimate, dead objects. They're alive. They're still alive. And they've taken on all the experiences of life to end up with this fantastic patina, character, and texture. And it's that texture and character and the DNA of the subjects and the people that made them that I try to capture in my work. So normally my paintings might take a week or weeks to produce because I like to paint very slowly normally and uh, take my time <clears throat> because I love to paint. First and foremost I'm a painter and I love to paint. So because I love the actual painting process I don't want to rush it. Why would you rush something you like doing? Like eating a nice dinner. You wouldn't rush it, would you? <laughs> she said she would. <laughs> so I like to take my time. However, here we haven't got that much time. We've got an hour. So I'm going to give you a snapshot of what I do. I'm going to take a few shortcuts, but I'm going to give you a synthesis of my way of working. Okay? Now, at times, now I said normally I like to do things very slowly. At times, what you'll see is a blur, okay? This is my ninja training from a previous incarnation. So you might not see me, I'll be moving so quick, but don't be alarmed. <laughs> Just joking. Right, so the subject I'm cho I've chosen today is uh, a subject from a, an abbey somewhere in France, somewhere. And uh, there was an old door, because I like doors. And behind this door was a beautiful garden. And <clears throat> I call this painting Door to a Secret Garden. So I'm going to get stuck in right now, he said. Because I'm right-handed, I always have all my gear on the right, and I'm quite organised, usually. So I usually put the water on the, into the uh, saucer for my first washes with a pipette. That way I can keep my bowl of water clean as long as possible. going to mix up a nice wash of raw sienna. I've pre prepped the paper 
So I've done a little simple drawing, five minutes, very minimal detail. The, uh, I've put some masking fluid on it. These bits of paper here are to cover up larger areas where I want to preserve the whites for the time being. Later on, I'll take these bits of paper off and see if I still want those whites. If I don't, I can glaze over them, lose them, blend them into the... But it's better to preserve more whites at the beginning if you're a pure watercolour painter like I am, where I don't use any white paint, I don't use any black, it's better to preserve more whites than you think you need. Okay, here we go. First wash, I'm looking for the consistency of milk. Never scrimp on your paints. Scrimp, is that a word, scrimp? That's a bit weird, isn't it? No. Have another go. How do you attach the paper on top of it to preserve the white paint? How do you put that on? This, these, yeah. just with bits of, bits of um, masking tape. Oh, I see. Okay. The other thing I do is, every time you, for all the painters in here, watercolour painters, you know, every time you touch the paper with your fingers, you change it forever with your hands. You change it forever. You leave a bit of yourself on the paper. You might end up with things like cauliflowers, stuff like that. Um, so only touch the paper when you're actually committing yourself to making marks. Off we go. This is to activate the paper. We're activating it. Pipette. Blimey, it didn't take as long as I thought. Thank you. <laughs> okay. That's that. Let that, that settle a little bit. Just move that to the side slightly. The reason I'm doing that is so that I don't drop any of this raw sienna into this manganese blue. Some more manganese blue. Beautiful colour. Transparent. Slightly granulating. For anybody who likes to paint landscapes, it's a nice a colour to use for the sky, if you're that way inclined. Now I've dropped a little bit of, yellow, of uh, raw sienna into this saucer just to take the edge slightly off the manganese blue and it steers it towards a sort of luminous, <coughs> luminous green. These washes are quite thin. Quite often when I'm pa well, painting, I, could, I would paint up to 24 layers of uh, thin transparent wash, one after the other, waiting for each one to dry, dry in between which takes hours, um, to build up the tonal definition of the painting. So I'm just going to simulate this today because we can't sit here waiting for all this paint to dry, so I will use a hairdryer, courtesy of Claire. <laughs> when I say Claire, you're supposed to run up here. Uh, me up now. Just to test. When I say... Courtesy of Claire. <laughs> hey. Are you ready? Yeah, no, not yet. I haven't done anything. <laughs> sit, <laughs> sit down, sit down. <laughs> it pays to rehearse these things. You know. Anyway, first wash on this beautiful door. I suppose I should really have a reference image, shouldn't I, which I found earlier in my pocket. Let's have a little look. Close. So, <laughs> okay, so that's that, that's that. Just want this bit here. Activating, just let that go a little bit like that. If you rock the board, uh, you'll uh, get uh, granulating pigments just to fall. The, the uh, heavier pig particles of paint will fall into the uh, uh, hollows in the paper. My paper is. Bockingford 425 gram, which is 200 pounds, heavyweight paper, which I always stretch onto wooden boards because during my process, the, the paper does take a bit of a battering as we go along and I, I need it drum tight the whole time. 
I don't want things I'm painting, like bits of engine and stuff, to suddenly look warped. I want everything in the place that it started off with. OK, turning to this one here. Let's get that one. Move that across there. This is uh, yellow ochre. Just going to start my first activation of textures. Now, this can be a long process normally, but I'm, as I said, giving you a snapshot of it. Some uh, Claire, could you get? Could you? Could you? About that much. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Well, you, yes. Oh. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Isn't she, isn't she great? I'll put you in my case and we can go. Anyway. Um, right, so um, first activation of texture. They used to make these out of hog's hairs, but I don't know if they do anymore. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a bristle brush. And here we go. If you do this, always, always go at right angles to the paper. You should normally have a little test first, but we haven't got time for testing. Right, and what I'm looking for is tiny little splatters of yellow ochre uh, this is a, yellow ochre is a, is a similar color to raw sienna as you can see but it's more opaque so when it hits the raw sienna underneath it has a little bit of a battle with it um, and it, you can create some very nice effects where one's pushing the other out of the way um, and you've, you've, you have to experiment with these things to find out what works for you. I'm off a bit of the bottom of that door. This is um, <coughs> drop-in wash technique. And that was a sort of a flick. <laughs> Used to be good at Marley's. Anybody remember marbles? Give you a game after. Over here. Okay, now while I've got that in that state, this is something that you, you fix bicycles with. Okay. You can find one of these in your garage. And this is, this is a technique called bruising, uh, which uh, nobody else knows about. You keep everything I'm telling you secret, by the way. Okay, don't tell anybody. Don't want them copying me. Okay, this is called bruising, right? So we're trying to simulate hundreds of years of weather, war, famine, cold, heat, everything else, rain, hitting this old ancient wall. So what... what Come in, yep. So we're creating even greater hollows in the paper. And this is why I use very heavy paper, so it can take this battering. This is a, I don't know what this is called, somebody gave it me. But it's, it's a kind of, something to do with embroidery. Yeah, so it's not sharp, but it's, um, it's quite blunt. So this is, this is great. Just activate this a little bit. This is great, because you can press into the paper. Now, there are cracks in this wall, right? And if you press down hard, right, the paint will run into these furrows. Furrows. In the paper and you get nice dark lines. Now remember, you can, get, you can get carried away with this because it's such fun to do, um, but what you, it does need to make sense with the architecture. You, you, know, you don't want to create something that looks like it's going to fall down. Um, so it's important that the actual cracks make sense and they follow the masonry, masonry lines that at one, once upon a time were there. 
you see. And we can find these later because after numerous washes, um, the actual underdrawing, which was, as you saw, was very little, just a few, uh, a few landscape, I call them, landmark lines um, to, to guide me, uh, can get lost. So, you know, if you're painting a big tractor or something, it's a bit difficult when you can't find the cylinders and all the other bits to do with it. So you have to peel back the uh, paint. Right, so that's that. That's that. that. That activates slightly. Okay, so now more spattering. Claire, could you get me some? Yes, more paper. <coughs> Thank you. <coughs> now, for all the people wash watching at home, and we could have 40 to 45,000 people watching from all over the world at this moment, hello people, um, they won't know that there's thousands of you in front of me. So what I'd like you to do is say hello to them after three so they can all, they know that you're live and I'm not just talking to myself, okay? One, two, three. Hello. That wasn't very normal. Terrible. One, two, three. Hello. That's better. See, see, people of the world, we do have living humans here in Shropshire at the AWM. Okay. Back to this. Burnt sienna. Beautiful colour. Beautiful. Bit of a delay there. Did you say that? I moved it and then it... Where was it for 10 seconds? <laughs> Burnt Sienna is definitely a go-to colour. Can... All the time, my first wash and the other paints I put on top are moving around. So uh, while I'm doing that, I'm, I've got one of my other eyes on what's happening elsewhere on the paper. Some of it's drying, some of it's still very, very wet. It's all moving about and I'm, I'm, my radar is up to see what I, what's happening and what I need to do. All the time your paint is wet or damp, you can, you can do things to it. Now, in all these books you buy, because you all buy lots of books, don't you? You only need one book, and that's at the back. No. Um, all these books you buy, because you see, you see the next book's got the secrets that you need, hasn't it? It's going to give you the secret that you need so you can make great paintings, isn't it? Yeah, we've all been there. So we ended up with hundreds of books that we don't look at, because after the cover, you lose the will to whatever, don't you? Right? But I think they all copy the same person who didn't really know what they were doing. Because they, they don't actually tell you what you want to know, do they? They don't say when to have the board sloping, when to have it flat, what the colours that the paints actually do, that you don't need hundreds of brushes, you only need two or three, and actually a very limited palette is all you need. Very limited palette. A family, if, as long as you know, have a little family of colours that you know work together, Dropping wash. Trying to find some perspective lines. Needs to make sense what you're painting. And I think you need, you, need, you need to not just love painting, but you need to love the subject that you're going to paint, especially when you spend weeks doing it like me because, you know, you have good days and bad days. And you, you need to love that subject to want to retain, maintain the enthusiasm to carry on painting it. 
Yeah. You need that, that subject to call you so you can actually feel it and, f and love it. It's very, very important to, to have that passion for what you're doing. Okay, Claire, could you? She's moving up in the world. I'm going to hold it here. Go up and down like you're mowing the lawn. Do you mow the lawn? No. Have you got a lawn? Yeah. Just do that, do that. Okay, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Claire, that was excellent, excellent. Just do it now. <laughs> Any good, Claire? Okay, right now, moving on quickly. Sometimes I will be silent so I can concentrate. Right, I'm going to... When your water gets like this, okay, don't drink it. Just tip it away, and Claire, could you, and get some, get some clean water. Oh yes, we, we don't want to get electrocuted. Okay. Don't shake. Okay. You're shaking. Bit more, bit more, bit more. Thank you, Claire. That's an excellent, excellent bit of help there. Excellent from Claire. She's lovely. Right then. One of your best, best tools you've got, this is assuming you have hands, of course. For those without any hands, this won't work because you do need to have your finger. If you haven't got hands, you can use a screwdriver or something just to flick the paint. When it's in a, a semi-dry state, you can use it to... Uh, get right back to the underlying wash and, and create some texture. If you don't like to touch the paint with your bare, bare skin, wear some rubber gloves. <laughs> it won't be as nice. Okay, when it's in, see this in its semi-dry state, you can get right back and peel, that, peel those two or three layers of wash I've put on there back. Follow your masonry lines round. See that? See that? You can only do this when the paint's in that state. And to find that state is a, a, a trial and error and a lot of practice. Okay. Looks all right here. It looks a bit weird up there. Never mind. I'm not going to look up there. Back to my door. Manganese blue tends to go all milky and cloudy so, uh, after you've mixed the wash, so you have to uh, continually keep activating it by stirring, stirring it. Yeah. So I'm just floating this manganese blue over the top of what's already there. And it's important when you, when you do multi-layering and glazing not to push down with your brush because you'll start to activate the wash underneath and then you'll end up with something like mud. So there are times to be quite firm with the, uh, with the board and the paint and the, and the brushes and other times you have to be very calm and gentle, like you're stroking a cat. And just with a real cat, you must stroke it the right way. 
If you stroke the cat the right way, it purrs, doesn't it? If you stroke it the wrong way, it's a world of pain, isn't it? Yeah, we don't want any pain, do we? <laughs> no. <laughs> Just trying to find that perspective line going up there. Okay. Looking for granulating pigments, looking for any help the paint will give us to try and simulate years and years of texture. Back to my special piece of equipment here. And these special pieces of wood that were carved for me, carved for me, by a tribal Aborigines <laughs> from Bilston. And they... Yeah. This is called a tea square. Don't try and drink it. Okay, now, this is a good way to get straight lines. Because what we want to do is we want lots of grain in that door frame. This is a spring, which we don't want, no we don't. Spring, so you can f find a use for all these kind of things. I don't mind what I do to this paper to achieve the painting I want to achieve. So I don't mind what I use as long as I still use transparent, pure watercolour. And as long as the paper will take it. So with a spring, if you pull it down, push down and pull it down the door while it's wet give it a few bashes like that and on your wall you can start to get some very interesting effects he said that's down so I know where they are Okay, back to yellow ochre. Just going to put the board flat a second, Gary, okay? See? Completely clean, isn't it? Tara will be pleased. Yellow ochre, back to this wall. You've got to enjoy your painting, haven't you? There's no point doing this if you don't enjoy it, is there? No point. When you're painting, you know time has no meaning. The world is somewhere else. You're just lost in another zone, aren't you? A very nice meditative place. Unless you're doing something like this, of course. Yellow ochre. And uh, they say in these books that you've all got, oh, you must work light to dark and you must never put light things on top of dark things and you do but why why can't you you can because you you're just layering 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 and every time you layer another color on top of another color if you do it at the right moment what you're doing is you're creating lots of translucent layers and you're gradually modulating the colour waves from underneath 
and you'll end up with a range of colors that are magical. And that you'll end up also with that mysterious thing that watercolor gives us, that glow of the paper, because the white of the paper will still glow through all these translucent layers. Nice, I like that. I like that. If you're painting away and you do something you like, tell it, tell yourself, oh, I like that bit. <coughs> the mistake you can make is, and we've all done it, if you like that bit, you do it again. <laughs> then you say, oh, do it again, then you end up with something that you don't like. So if you do really do like something, it's best just to stop and pause for a moment and walk away, have a cup of tea and come back and see if it's still there. Water into paint gives you, at this, at, when it's at this, uh, at this stage, water into paint gives you a kind of, um, like a frosty effect, frost, morning, early morning frost. So if anybody wants to paint a sort of winter scene or a field early morning with a frost on it, if you paint it and then spatter clean water into it and leave it to paint itself, you will end up with something like that. Yeah. Okay. Okay, now time for Claire again. Dave, sorry, keep going track, you're about halfway through. Claire, hair dry. <laughs> quick, quick. Put, it, put it on maximum. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Claire. That wasn't very generous, was it? Like, come on. Well done. Credit where due. Okay. Not totally dry, but we'll have to work with it because Gary says we're halfway through. Sfumatu. Invented by Leonardo da Vinci. Da Vinci. Da Vinci. It's from West Bromwich. Da Vinci. Tapping the paint with his fingers to create soft, subtle edges. Of course, he wasn't using watercolour paint, but you can, and just tap the edges. You've got nice, soft transitions, and you can, you can get that with this without using a brush. Okay, now if you want to know if your, paint, if your paint is dry, just look on the side, see if it's still glistening, which it kind of is. Right, get some of that in. Right, cobalt blue. Start to find some shadows. Cobalt blue. Yeah. Cobalt blue with a little bit of rose madder. Gives a sort of lavender colour, which is beautiful. As this is a door in a French abbey, I suppose we should do a bit of lavender. Right, so I'm going to follow the shadow round at the top of the door. Wet brush, board flat, soft edge to this, sh this shadow, this side, 
pull it round, and let it go. Soften that edge some more. More manganese. Very board's very wet now. As you can see, there are puddles of paint, which is okay if the board's flat and you, you, you've got heavy paper and it's stretched. If it wasn't stretched, it would start, the paper would start to cockle and it wouldn't be very nice. But this is behaving itself at the moment, but keep an eye on it. Because we don't want mud, we still want these lovely, beautiful colours which are starting to form. Bag of sugar. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, no. No. I don't use salt. I don't use any chemicals or anything like that. I just use uh, things. Things, paints, and brushes. Okay. Back to this. Oh, Claire, hairdryer. 
Do, do, do. Thank you, Claire. <laughs> okay, right, next stage, right, let's get some detail in this door. So, cobalt blue, rose madder, nice purpley blue, I think, purpley blue. Rigger brush number two. To make it, it even thinner, just squeeze the brush so you've got a nice sharp edge. Kind of cream consistency. Just activate the tip of the brush. Some of this off. How long we got, Gary? Uh, 15 minutes. Oh, loads of time. See, I've only painted, painted half the paper. Let's take these off. A little sienna.
cerulean blue, a beautiful color. Carry on then. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.
declare Hair dry. 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 That door. door. Keep going. Keep going. Don't stop. Oh, oh no. Keep going. Lovely Claire. Well, there we go. There we go. Oops. There we go. Do -do -do -do. Door to a secret garden.